Okay, thank you everybody for uh, joining us here for this installment of uh, the IDCCA virtual training series. And we're very glad you could join us here tonight uh, for our session on uh, Illinois labor history. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping options. Everybody will be muted during tonight's training, um, but if you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll have time for a question and answer at the end of our presentation. Uh, as a reminder also, anybody, uh, this meeting is being recorded, so anybody who attended here tonight or registered will receive a copy of the presentation and any PowerPoint that went along with it. So if you missed something or wanna go back and ask questions later, uh, you will get a copy of that. Um, please remember to be respectful of everybody attending the meeting here tonight. It's going to last about an hour, so try to put away any distractions uh, and be present for the meeting or for the training session. <laughs> and it looks like we've got everybody in, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to IDCCA President Christina Zahorek. Hello and welcome everyone. Um... This particular session tonight is, is near and dear to my heart. Um, I come from a labor family, a long line, and I married a, a good union man. Um, for those of you who were gracious enough to read our Labor Day message, you'll know that um, in part, uh, my family was able to kind of move up the ladder a bit because of labor and because of my father's ability to um, um, actually uh, save some money and uh, uh, get a down payment on a house. And um, part of that was because of the GI Bill, but also that was in large part because he became um, a reporter for uh, a local paper. And prior to that, he was actually a, an, an iron worker. Um, and um, I think it's really important as we, as Democrats, that we understand and have a robust understanding, frankly, of labor and labor history. And the, here in Illinois, it's even more important because of the close ties between um, labor history and Illinois and some very um, important landmarks that happened here in our state. And I felt that this was, um, personally, just an important uh, uh, touchstone to make sure that not only do our members understand um, the history uh, of the movement um, and also just the connections between labor and the Democratic Party uh, here in, in, in Illinois in particular. Um, tonight, I think it's very exciting. We have a really special uh, guest, um, and that, of course, is Mike Matika. And he is the vice president of the Labor History Society. He retired from the Great Plains Laborers District Council staff and uh, Layuna Local 362 member. For 40 years, he edited the Bloomington and Normal Trades and Labor Assemblies Grand Prairie Union News. And he's a McLean County Historical Society board member. He's been a guest curator for five exhibits at this nationally accredited museum. Most recently, Challenges, Choices, and Change, Working for a Living. He's the author of Fiery Struggle, documenting Illinois firefighter unionization, and the co-author of Bloomington CNA Shops. So thank you so much for being here tonight, Mike, and we cannot wait to hear what you have to present. Okay, thank you, Christina, and welcome everybody. I hope you um, enjoy this. Illinois labor history, we could spend many hours talking about it because Illinois is truly a significant state. So think of this as kind of a highlights reel. I'm gonna go through some significant events, probably miss some significant events. Uh, I'm trying to give a sense of the real critical role that labor played. And when I approach this, I often tried to think of not just working conditions, wages, which are very important, but a labor union is an exercise in democracy. It's an it's a organization where members have a say in their workplace and where they spend the majority of their day. Um, and many people, particularly people new to these shores, um, learn democracy first in a union hall before they learned it in a ballot box. So I think a framework for this is really to think about democracy, not just every two to four years in election, but democracy every day on the job. And I think it's also maybe important 
for just very basic to give a definition of what a labor union is. And it's workers coming together, again, in a democratic way. They elect their own leaders. They financially support their organization. And as a united group, they bargain with their employer. So sit down with their employer and negotiate contract, working condition, wages, and important parts of the job. I think the other thing too is too often when we go to history class, we learn about history from the viewpoint of the wealthy and the famous. Um, we don't learn about average working people. And average people are significant players in American history. It's because average people stood up both enslaved people and people who were abolitionists to abolish slavery. It took generations for different groups to win the right to vote in this country. It took many years to win the legal right to form a union and to get decent wages and conditions. So this is kind of a bottom-up view of history and not necessarily a top-down, but I, I think sometimes we underestimate what average people can do in uh, in shaping this country and shaping their own life. Um, Illinois is probably the state for labor history in these United States. And we can go around this state and find a large number of union locals number one, which means they were the first local of that union organized in the country. So, um, you know, that tells you how significant Illinois is. We're gonna look at a few of these stories, but people may have heard of the Haymarket incident in Chicago, the Pullman strike, the Republic Steel massacre, and even more recent history, public employees in Illinois winning the right to unionize. So again, we're not gonna get in depth on all of these or any of these, but at least give you a flavor of some of the things that have gone on in the state that had not only national, but international repercussions. Um, it's important to look at working class life, particularly looking back over a um, century and a century and a half ago. Um, in the days before there was social security, before there was unemployment insurance, before there were um, food stamp programs, being a working class person was a tough way, way to survive. Wages were low. Employment was irregular. You didn't know day to day sometimes if you're gonna have a job or not have a, have a job. Safety was a um, precarious situation and the rate of injury and death on the job was pretty high and often very severe. People lived in slums. They did not necessarily have decent housing. And of course, child labor was rampant across this country. So when you stack that group up and say, people had to come together to change their conditions. We're talking about a lot of courage for people to be able to, to do this and took a lot of risk. And sometimes they won, but often they lost in those efforts to improve and, and change their conditions on the job. What were some of the things workers were looking for? Um, child labor was a multi-year struggle. We'll talk a little bit about the eight hour day, which took over 50 years to become law in this country. Of course, people wanted better wages, better conditions, but most of all too, they wanted a right to be able to organize and to be heard on the job. And so these were kind of the conditions that propelled people to organize unions and to get involved in their communities and to often take on and very readily take on entrenched power, entrenched capital, political power, to bring the uh, changes they needed in their lives. Gonna start here, and this is not necessarily the beginning, but again, it gives you a sense of desperation. Um, in 1877, people may have heard stories about the Great Depression of the 1930s. Well, the Great Depression of the 19th century was a depression that lasted from 1873 to about 1879. And again, without government job programs without many of the protections that people enjoy today, no unemployment, nothing to fall back on. After wages had been reduced a number of times already, and of course people are working 10 and 12 hour days, Monday through Saturday, they might get a Sunday off, um, the great uprising emerged. And this was not an organized movement, but basically a national conflagration that spread across the country. 
It began in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Um, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad had announced that they were lengthening trains, which would make the trains more unsafe, and cutting wages and cutting the number of workers who would move a train, which again cut safety conditions. In Martinsburg, West Virginia, people just said no, and they walked off the job. And this um, action spread across the eastern and midwestern states over the course of a week. Um, Chicago, St. Louis, East St. Louis, Detroit, New York, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, all these cities were basically running street battles between the working class who were fed up with their conditions and local militias and eventually the United States military. And in Chicago, in particular, um, federal troops, which had been being dispatched to kill Native Americans in the West, were stopped in Chicago and basically let loose on the working class. And uh, if people are familiar with the area in Pilsen, on the near west side around 18th Street, there was about two days of running um, battles between immigrant workers and um, Chicago police and the military um, along Halstead Street. About 30 people killed in the streets in Chicago at this time period. Um, militia units were set to put down coal miners in Braidwood. Federal troops were sent to um, St. Louis and East St. Louis. Um, and the attitude was that basically the working class, and these were predominantly immigrant workers who were taking to the streets, had to be put down. And it was put down very brutally. Um, but this gives you a sense of people's desperation, that they were willing to go to the streets and basically face off against the United States military because they were that frustrated with their lives and their, uh, and their working conditions. Maybe to give a little sense of what those working conditions were like, I um, invite you to look at this photograph a little bit closely. This is the McLean County Mine in Bloomington. These coal miners in this photograph are about 400 feet underground um, and they're digging coal. And look at the railroad tracks at their feet. Um, there were tracks underground with um, carts that rolled on them that were pulled by mules. The mules lived underground and the worker was not paid by the hour but paid by the uh, ton. So depending on how much they would dig out every day, that's how much they got paid. And if you look over their heads, you see some heavy timbers. And um, those timbers were not necessarily put there by the coal company, but the miners themselves, as they went to work in what was called their room into their face of coal, um, they had to make a life and death decision every day. How much coal were they gonna dig out because they didn't get paid by the hour, they got paid by the ton. And how much time were they going to spend protecting their environment? So they had to decide, are we going to spend our day putting up timbers, making this a safe place to work? Are we going to take risk of cave-in or rock falling on us to um, dig out more coal so we can get paid more money at the end of the day? Um, the light on their heads is a carbide lamp, which kind of illuminated their way underground. And um, no electricity, no torches, and no workers' compensation. So if someone was hurt or injured or killed, and you can see the statistics there um, on the uh, side of the screen there, 89 people per year on average dying in Illinois coal mines, um, you know, it's pretty real challenge that miners faced every day was, was how well they were going to work and how well they were gonna survive in these conditions. Um, one of the things that brought change in this situation was the um, Cherry Mine disaster, November 13th, 1909, Cherry's in Bureau County. It's a small town, but in the early 1900s, it was a booming mining community. Um, the Cherry Mine was a modern mine. It had electricity underground, so the workers could have better illumination as they um, worked. And that week in November, part of the electrical system went down. So workers went back to using torches and carbide lamps to see their way underground. Um, because there were mules, 
that pulled the coal carts underground. A coal a cartload of hay came down the elevator to feed the mules. And either a lamp or a torch fell into that, it caught on fire. The um, miners at that point tried to push the cart back on the elevator to take it back up to the top of the mine. They were unsuccessful in doing that. And a fire began to spread in the coal and in the timbers underground. The mining supervisor at the top of the mine had what he considered a very brilliant idea. There was a giant exhaust fan that sucked air and tried to aid air circulation. He decided to reverse the fan and thought that pushing air in would put the fire out. We all know what the ingredients of fire are and it created a huge catastrophe. Um, 259 men and boys died underground that day in Cherry, Illinois. Um, the photograph here is the um, cemetery in the town of Cherry with the monument there that was erected by the uh, United Mine Workers Union. Sometimes I take groups of school children there and I tell the children, um, span out across this cemetery and find me the youngest person buried here who died on November 13th, 1909. And a student will come back, I found a 14 year old, I found a 12 year old. Finally, one will come back and say, well, I found a nine year old. And so these were literally small children working underground in the, uh, in the mines at this point. Um, because this was, not just an Illinois story, but an international story, because about almost 50% of the miners who worked at Cherry were immigrants. This created a lot of um, press, lurid press almost, of this underground fire across Europe and led to Illinois passing in 1911 its workers' compensation law. So the, for the first time in Illinois, um, companies had to take and become involved in carrying insurance to pay for deaths and injuries that happened to workers who were employed by that company. And so it took 259 deaths to make this happen. Um, but again, it kind of gives you a very real sense of the risk that working people faced. Um, another very famous Illinois incident is the Haymarket and the fight for the eight hour day. Um, the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, which is still with us today, was, was a fledgling new amalgamation of labor unions um, in, the, in the 1880s. And in 1884, this AFL, this new organization, decided to call for a nationwide day of protest for the eight hour day on May 1st, 1886. And, um, you know, it was in, think of it as a, as a stroke of uh, propaganda to spread the need for the eight hour day. The slogan workers used at the time period, you'll see on the button here, was eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for whatever I will. So in other words, people would have an opportunity to, um, to have recreation time, have rest time, and not be spending 10 to 12, sometimes 14 hours a day in the, um, in the workplace. Chicago, in particular, became a national focus for this eight-hour movement. And not only trade unionist, but Chicago had a very active socialist movement and also an anarchist movement at the time period. And, and I should be clear on the 19th century term, meaning of those terms. Um, the socialist, and there was very active socialist party in Illinois, um, believed that by getting elected to office, they could change um, the laws so that enterprises would be owned by the by the government or by the community, and wages and profits would be divided amongst the workers. Um, so you had an active socialist movement with people running for office. The anarchists were socialists who believed in revolution. 
and they thought no matter who got elected to office, that capitalism was too powerful to be overthrown or to be changed through legislative means. And so they basically believed that it would require a revolution to make change. These diverse groups all came together around this eight hour movement. Um, and this is a time period of very heavy German immigration into Illinois. And probably about 40 to almost 50% of Chicago's population and much of Illinois' population at this time was either first or second generation German immigrants. So it would not have been um, untypical to walk down the street in almost any Illinois city and hear German spoken. And think about how we treat immigrants in this country. Um, and many of the anarchists were of German immigrant status and um, were branded as dangerous foreigners. Um, they were very outspoken against the capitalist system. And of course, the capitalist system in terms of the Chicago Tribune and the power structure of Illinois found them very fearful and um, created a lot of clash and a lot of very strong language on both sides. May 1st, 1886, the, the day set for the protest, 40,000 people marched down Michigan Avenue. Over 50 Chicago workplaces went on strike for the eight hour day. And people had a real sense that they might be able to, to win a victory here. Um, May 2nd was a Sunday. May 3rd was the first working day. And again, there were over 40 workplaces on strike in Chicago at McCormick's Reaper plant. And um, people may re remember them of Cyrus McCormick who um, perfected the a mechanical reaper. Um, he had locked out his workers in February. So a crowd gathered outside his plant. They were shouting at the scabs, at the strike breakers who had taken their jobs. The Chicago Police Department came in horse drawn wagons and shot into the crowd, killing two people. Um, the predominantly anarchist faction called a mass meeting. For the next night, May 4th, in Haymarket Square in Chicago, um, basically against police brutality. So issues we deal with today in, in politics are not necessarily new issues, but things that are, that are still with us. And look very carefully at the um, leaflet on the left here. You'll see it in English and German. Halfway down, you'll see the line, working men, arm yourself and appear in full force bring your guns. Um, the folks at the anarchist group who printed these decided this probably was not a wise thing to put in print. So the leaflet on the right is the one that they actually circulated, but this later became very important evidence that was used against them because of this um, call to use force. The actual meeting was fairly peaceful. Um, the mayor of Chicago, Carter Harrison, a Democrat, had given permission for the gathering. It was at Randolph and Des Plaines Street. Um, the um, organizers had hoped that five to 10,000 people would appear. About 2,500 people showed up. It was raining, it wasn't very pleasant. It was not well organized. People were not necessarily set up in advance to speak. People were kind of called out of the crowd or summoned to come up and give a speech. About 9.30 that evening, Mayor Harrison, um, seeing that things were relatively calm, went down the street to the Des Plaines Street Police Station and told the captain on duty to send his men home. And um, Mayor left at that point and went to um, his residence. The police department had listeners, spies, whatever you want to call them, who were listening to the speakers and they came back to the police station and reported that radical things were being said. Um, the police captain then decided to break the rally up. So armed with Winchester repeater rifles and pistols, shoulder to shoulder blocking the street, the police contingent marched on the um, rally. And uh, Samuel Fielden, an English immigrant, was speaking at the time. Police captain told him to disperse, to end this event. 
field and explain that it was almost over, they would be gone soon. And about that time, um, from a side alley came a um, dynamite bomb. Okay. And eight police officers were killed when that bomb exploded. Four or five of the people in the protest were killed. Um, Matthias Deegan was a police officer directly killed by the bomb. Um, others probably may have been shot by other police. Again, you have gas lamps, you don't have strong illumination, bomb explodes, pistols and guns come out, and um, people are, are killed on both sides of this. Um, this was a very provocative event, probably the first time in world history that dynamite had been used in this kind of situation. Um, the next day, newspapers around the globe are talking about riot, anarchy, um, and rebellion in Chicago. About 400 people were rounded up and jailed without charges, and eventually eight people were put on trial because of this. Seven of them were immigrants, six Germans, and Samuel Fielden, one English, and one American, Albert Parsons, who was originally from Texas. Um, they did not, the, most of the evidence used against them was not direct evidence, but was actually their words, things they had said that were considered radical. Um, the only one where they could find some actual physical evidence was Louis Ling, who had been in the country about four or five years, was a very strong German radical, and um, his, one of his friends turned state's evidence on him. The police raided Ling's apartment and found bomb making materials. But the other seven, um, basically the evidence used against them was their words, was things they had written in the anarchist press about overthrowing the economic system and about changing the, um, changing the economic system in this country. Um, Julius Grinnell was the state's attorney for Cook County who prosecuted. And at one point he said, it really doesn't matter, and I'm paraphrasing here, if these men are guilty or not. We should hang them to make an example to others like them. Um, and the uh, trial itself was not conducted as one would expect a trial to be conducted. The jury was not a jury of the peers. It was a hand-selected upper middle class jury. The presiding judge, because this was a show trial, invited debutantes and the daughters of the wealthy to come sit up on the judge's bench with him. So courtroom decorum was not well enforced. Um, eventually, of the eight, seven were sentenced to hang. Oscar Neby, who had the least connection to this, was sentenced 15 years of hard labor. There was a global outcry after the sentence that the trial was not fair. And delegations came to Springfield to the governor to try to change this. Um, the Illinois Supreme Court was petitioned to hold another trial. They refused to do that. And eventually Governor Oglesby said that if the seven convicted would admit their guilt, he would commute the sentence from hanging to life in prison. Um, Samuel Fielden and Michael Schwab took that offer and their sentences were, um, were changed from hanging to um, life in prison. The other five refused, said we're not guilty and we're not gonna admit our guilt. So um, November 11th, 1887 was set as the day of the hanging. The night before the hanging, um, the police came into Lewis Ling's jail cell, offered him a cigar, had a good smoke, Mr. Ling, because you're gonna die tomorrow. Ling lit up the cigar and there was a dynamite cap in it, blew his face off. Um, the other four, Parsons, Spees, Fisher, and Engel, sang the uh, French Marseillaise on their way to the gallows. The last words from Albert Parsons were, let the voice of the people be heard. Um, 400 reserve seats were set up in the Cook County Jail that day to witness their execution. Um, mostly the journalist and the elite of Chicago were there. Um, Haymarket had a profound impact in multiple ways. 
um, around the world, people still celebrate May 1 as Labor Day. And in many countries, if you ask people why May 1st is Labor Day, they'll tell you to honor the martyrs of Chicago because this fight for the eight hour day took on an international resonance after Haymarket. Um, many American unionists, particularly in the American Federation of Labor, saw what happened and, and were very careful not to challenge the economic system, but to simply try to improve conditions for the members of the union. Um, the photograph here is the monument that was erected in June of 1893 over the grave of these martyred workers. Um, you can go visit it at Forest Home Cemetery in Chicago today. The day after the monument was erected, John Peter Altgelt, German immigrant, governor of Illinois, um, commuted the sentence of the three that were still in prison and released them and wrote a scathing document that said these people never had a fair trial. Um, that was the end of Altgelt's political career. Um, he was so scorned by the press, um, he would never be elected to anything again. Um, that's why you'll find him if you go back in your books and look for John F. Kennedy's Profiles and Courage, you'll see John Peter Altgelt is one of the people in that story because he believed fairness was not part of the process here in, in the hay market. But again, there's, there is a, a very important lesson here that some Americans took as don't challenge capitalism. And that could be why in the United States we don't have a labor party that we see in, in other parts of the world. But again, this Haymarket incident had international resonance. Illinois was legislatively a leader. Um, and these are just some of the laws that Illinois passed early on. Um, child labor law in 1903, Federal child labor law did not come till 1938. Um, so Illinois was ahead and often the first state to pass many of these laws to protect workers. I should point out 1926, the anti-injunction bill, what that means in the early 20th century, if people went on strike or protested their working conditions, um, very common for companies to go to the courts and get an injunction declaring that the strikers were hindering the property owner from using their facility. In other words, stopping the factory owner from running his factory. And then if workers continued to strike, they were breaking the law. And um, so this anti-injunction bill said you could not use court injunctions um, in labor disputes. And it, you can still do it, but it laid some very strict guidelines of when court injunctions could be invoked in labor disputes. And again, Illinois was a, was a leader in this effort. I wanna look here at a couple women who I think are, are always worth remembering. Um, Jane Addams' birthday was just a few days ago. Um, people will be familiar here, her as a founder of social work in this country. But uh, Jane Addams was significant with Whole House for attracting women who found a place where they could um, be more involved in society than society at the time let them. And Whole House became a training ground for many of these women. Um, Florence Kelly was Illinois' first factory inspector, um, a strong advocate for child labor, a founder of the NAACP. And I, I often conjure in 1903 when Illinois passed its factory inspection law, that here comes this petite young woman knocking on the door, going into factories to look at what's going on there and, um, and being, um, you know, basically get off this property um, because there was such a sense of private property and property rights um, that took a lot of courage for her to do that. Alice Hamilton lived to be 101 years old and really is the founder of um, occupational disease studies in this country and for years was recognized as an international expert on occupational diseases. She was the first woman in, in, who joined the faculty at Harvard Medical School and her lifetime specialty became um, occupational disease. 
And Mary McDowell, who's known as the um, angel of the stockyards, was someone who built community organization within the stockyards in Chicago, and again, with a strong interracial um, emphasis. So these are middle-class women who got involved in labor questions and labor issues. Also, one remembers some working class women. Um, Lucy Parsons was probably born a slave, an enslaved person in Texas. She married Albert Parsons, one of the people hung at Haymarket. They came to Chicago. After Albert's hanging, Lucy continued to be the living symbol of what happened at Haymarket, was thrown in jail repeatedly as she stood on Chicago street corners and spoke about what happened to her husband and spoke up for labor rights. People have probably heard of Mother Jones, um, who came to Canada in, uh, when she was 12 years old as an immigrant, uh, married an a iron molder named George Jones. They moved to, to Memphis after the Civil War. A yellow fever came through the community and uh, Mary Jones lost her husband and four children in two weeks came to Chicago, opened a dress shop, and it burned in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. So this woman was having a string of bad luck, became a seamstress for wealthy people in Chicago, and um, when she was about 59 or 60, um, decided she's not gonna take it anymore, and just took to the streets in this grandmotherly kind of persona she um, invented, and really stirred up working class people with her bravery and her outspoken words. Um, Betsy Abramowitz was a blacklisted clothing worker in Chicago who, working on the buttonhole line at Hart Shafter and Marx, um, they cut the piece rate for buttonholes a quarter of a cent. And Betsy said, I'm not going to take it anymore, and walked out. And pretty soon, 8,000 clothing workers were on the uh, streets of Chicago. And we think of Chicago stockyards and some of these big enterprises. There were more clothing workers and stockyard workers in Chicago in the early 20th century. And she helped organize the amalgamated clothing workers. And um, last one over here, Addie was a woman who came out of the South as part of the Great Migration, went to work in the stockyards in 1942, and rose to prominence within the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. Um, was on the cover of Time magazine um, and very active not only in labor circles but also within her church. I'm um, going to wrap it up here so we have time for questions but the 1930s were very significant because of the um, Great Depression. 1933-34 were strikes across the country. Um, President Franklin Roosevelt got very involved and in 1935 he signed the National Labor Relations Act which gave workers the right to organize the union and out of that came the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which organized mass industry. Auto workers, farm implement workers, packing house workers all came together. Another very significant story is the rise of the Pullman Porter, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the first successful African-American led union in the country, um, spent 12 years, 1925 to 1937, um, winning their rights to a union contract with the Pullman Company, which was a huge Chicago employer, and at the time was the largest employer of African-Americans in the country. Just mentioned the Republic Steel Massacre, Memorial Day, 1937, um, workers were trying to organize at Republic Steel on the south side of Chicago. They marched on the plant and were um, shot at by Chicago police. And police claimed it was a riot, but eventually the newsreel came out and showed that these people were attacked and shot in the back by the police. Um, in the 1960s through the 1980s, public employees, um, teachers, firefighters, um, city workers, state workers, organized into unions like AFSME, the Service Employees International Union, the IEA, the Illinois Education Association, the Illinois Federation of Teachers. Um, Illinois was one of the last states in the North to not have collective bargaining procedures for public employees. And finally, in 1983, a law was passed 
that allowed public employees in Illinois to organize a union. And actually at this point, Illinois probably has some of the most liberal and accessible laws for public employees to be able to organize. Um, gonna wrap it up here. You know, labor remains a significant force. It gives working people a voice. Um, we look at things like the Chicago teachers strike and the wave of teacher strikes across the country in the last two years. Those really grew out of the Chicago teachers and teachers across the country were inspired by the Chicago teachers. So unions continue to organize their members, not only for their well-being, but for their own community well-being also. Um, and I think I'm gonna stop there. I think just at the end, in terms of what we still face is this gig economy, this contingent economy, and how do people find a voice within a changing economy that's gone from an industrial model to a service model and make sure that people have equal rights and equal access in this country where we have a disparity between the average person and the wealthy that goes back to the 1890s to find another example of uh, that's so similar in terms of economic disparity. So it's kind of a running quick look at Illinois labor history, but I presume we've got a little time here for some questions, Jillian. Yeah, we, if, before we jump in, Jillian, I just want to I just want to highlight. I mean, I think you know one of the things that you talk about through a thread through all of this discussion is that struck me is two things. One, it's it's fairness. It's this notion of fairness. We just want things to be fair, and this other idea of the fact that the the things that you're talking about, while they seem so far away, they really aren't. I think about. Um, what's happening now in our country and the wage disparities coupled with this pandemic and um, these essential workers now that we're calling them and somehow they in some of the dialogue didn't seem to be so essential but now that they are and thank God for some of them that they have unions in order to provide the protections that they need um, during this pandemic and I, I also think about how you know labor supports and works with the Democratic Party and our candidates because, Democratic Party supports and enacts policies that will assist labor in order to, you, you, you gave a laundry list a little bit of um, legislation that Illinois was on the forefront and enacted. And in large part, that's because the Democratic support, the Democratic Party supports those policy initiatives that allow for those things to, to happen. And I, I also think about, you know, the last governor that we had and that four year battle, um, um, really trying to come after and dismantle labor, and in part because of that connection between labor and the Democratic Party. So um, um, I really appreciate you, Mike, coming on tonight and and sharing this this history and and making sure that we all come from that. Um, I believe, and 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 the folks that really are are here tonight and and part of this. So I'll I'll turn it over to Jillian. Um, and to say, you know, for some questions, but, but again, you know, there is that connection. The All right, um, a reminder that if you have any questions to put it in- uh, Democratic in Party. We lost Christina for just a minute there. A uh, reminder, if you have any questions, to put it down uh, in the chat. Um, we do have a few questions coming in. A lot of comments that uh, it sounds like like history is repeating itself. Um, and we have a question here about, uh, Mike, do you see any parallels between today um, and what occurred in 1877? And if so, what? Sure. Um, you know, when you look at things like Haymarket, and the issue together that night was police brutality. And so what is an issue we're talking about today is the proper role of police. Um, and particularly urban police were used not just against people of color, but also particularly against immigrants and against working people when they raise their head. So there's one. And the other one that Christina referred to is this economic disparity, which is equivalent to the Gilded Age of the 1890s when you look at statistics in this country today. 
and um, and people that, in a sense, are being beaten down because they have three to four jobs just to survive means for many folks, even though the workday is supposed to be eight, you know, the people are putting in 12 hour workdays just to keep a roof over their head and feed their kids. We have a question here. Uh, looks like they asked you to, if you could speak on the meat slaughtering unions from the 1970s, in particular, uh, the misconception that uh, many people seem to think that unions have actually caused companies to leave the area. Yeah. And what's fascinating is that when we look at um, industrial work in the Midwest, think of Caterpillar or, or um, John Deere and auto workers, meat packers were the highest paid industrial workers in the country. And through the United Packing House Workers, which became the United Food and Commercial Workers, they had achieved a, a decent standard of living for what was a very brutal job with a progressive interracial union. Um, Meat packers fled the Midwest, not because it was the workers' fault, but because they realized that by relocating to small towns in Iowa, Nebraska, Colorado, Oklahoma, they could pay lower wages. And what is basically now an immigrant workforce job with poor, with a terrible safety record and um, people having now facing COVID facing myriad injury problems and um, terrible exploitation. But it had nothing to do because meatpacking plants were not unprofitable. It had to do with greed. You know, they wanted to flee the industrialized Kansas City, East St. Louis, Omaha, Chicago, and move out to places closer to the point of production, closer to the cattle ranches but also transforming what was a decent industrial job into a immigrant, poorly paid and uh, exploited workforce. And if, if, I know you said that you went through kind of a brief history of Illinois labor history. If someone wants to learn more, uh, what's the best resource for them? Um, I would encourage people to join our Illinois Labor History Society um, and um, go to IllinoisLaborHistory.org and you can learn about us. We're not a high-priced outfit, but it's an all-volunteer group that works very hard to um, keep these stories alive. We've got a very active Facebook page that has something new on it every day. And um, again, every Illinois community has its story. And we often think of Chicago, but whether you're in Springfield or Marion or Rock Island, there was a labor struggle in your community and sometimes multiple labor struggles. And so, you know, all those stories deserve to be shared and passed on to another generation, not just for nostalgia, because there's nothing nostalgic about misery, but um, to realize the bravery and heroism that average people took to try to set up, to try to maintain and establish a voice in this country. Well, thank you, Mike. It looks like that's all of the questions that we've gotten uh, here tonight, but we do appreciate you coming in and speaking and sharing your expertise with us tonight. And thank you everybody um, who joined us here tonight. Uh, just a reminder that we did record this meeting. Uh, and so if you missed any part or wanna revisit it, um, you, you'll get a copy if the technology works out, hopefully within the next day or two. Um, yeah. And thank you all for joining us. And, and, and can I add, yeah. I am happy to, travel around and share this story. Um, let's put a little, little gas money in the tank and uh, we'll, uh, we'll come around and there are other people at the Illinois Labor History Society who are willing to do the same too because, uh, and they got, they got your own story in your own town too because you'll be fascinated. But thanks everybody for tuning in here. Thank you so much. Okay.